The vehicle in question, as this week's particular unsung hero, I would argue has one of the most fascinating stories that we've talked about so far. And actually, some of the people behind this car have among the most impressive resumes I've ever seen in terms of their achievements, and we're going to get to that in just a second. The story here is a fascinating one, as I said, and for those who are, for instance, BMW M car fans, the first thing you're thinking is probably, wait a second, there is no BMW M8. That's a recent thing. Of course, there was an 8 Series, which debuted at a motor show in 1989, with the 850 being the ultimate version, but there wasn't an M8. So how is this car possible? Well, the reason why it's possible, and yet still isn't well known, is because BMW flat out denied its existence until 2010, which is the first time they allowed the press to even see the car. It was then seen in 2012 at an automobile event in California. And apart from that, they keep it pretty quiet, and you can kind of understand why. Now, the story behind it is actually a fairly simple one. When BMW released the 8 Series in 1989 as their flagship exotic, it was a semi-impressive car. Impressive very much so in terms of the spec, from interior to visual design to the price, of course, but some of the things weren't necessarily up to an M car standard. For instance, the fact that it put out less than 300 horsepower from a V12 engine. Even back then, not that great. So, in a very reminiscent way of what happened with the inception of the Golf GTI at Volkswagen, a small team of people decided to try and impress BMW. They wanted to make their own M8 and then present it to BMW to be approved for production, to, of course, the highest possible standard and build a car that could be legitimately produced, not just a ridiculous one-off. And three of those minds involved were very impressive. There was a chassis specialist by the name of Gerhard Richter, and unfortunately I wasn't able to find a huge amount about his personal life on Google because the majority of the results are about an artist. And although that may be the same guy, I don't think it is, but I could be wrong. Two of the other names, though, are incredibly impressive. One is Karl Heinz Kulpfel. And although you probably haven't heard of him, he is a massively important person in BMW's lineage. Because although he'd been with the company since the early 70s, he actually became the chairman of BMW Motorsport, and in his time at BMW, they won the DTM in 1989, they won Le Mans in 1999, and they returned to F1 as an engine supplier in 2000 for Williams. So he's kind of a big deal. Then, the second name is Paul Roche. And Paul Roche is even more impressive, I would argue, but not on a business level, more so on an engineering level, because he literally was an engineer a brilliant engine designer. And although you might not recognise his name, you probably recognise the names of some of his greatest creations. He designed the BMW M70 V12. A certain McLaren F1 used that engine and became the fastest car in the world because of it. It also allowed McLaren to win Le Mans in 1995 with that same BMW power. His V12 design also allowed BMW themselves to win Le Mans, in 1999, with the V12 LMR. And as if that wasn't enough, he just so happens to also be the guy who designed the 1.5 litre formula engine used in the Benetton B186, a, as I said, 1.5 litre engine that puts out 1,400 horsepower, and is to this day still the most powerful Formula One car of all time. That's one hell of a resume. <laughs> the most powerful Formula car ever, the fastest car in the world for over a decade until Bugatti came along, and a 1999 Le Mans win. When minds of that calibre get together on a project, especially a project that has all of them focused in on one vehicle, well, chances are the vehicle's going to be very impressive. And impressive it certainly was, because the ironic thing about the M8 prototype is that the engine shares almost the exact same spec as the McLaren F1. Even the cubic capacity is the same, 60-64cc, a 6.1 litre naturally aspirated V12. But weirdly enough, it's not a McLaren F1 engine. It just happens to be very similar. <laughs> now, as far as power, it's not putting out the same figures as a McLaren. That would have been insane. 
But even though it's not borderline insane, it's not far off either, because this car was built in 1990, and it put out 550 horsepower, and in the region of 380 pound-feet of torque. And that is at a time when the ultimate cars from Porsche and Ferrari were not even close. That's 100 horsepower more than the Porsche 959, which was the ultimate Porsche at the time. That's 80 horsepower more than the fastest car in the world at the time, the Ferrari F40, with 470 horsepower. And it wasn't until three to four years later when other supercars would finally catch up to this kind of power, in the form of stuff like the Lister Storm, the Jaguar XJ220, and the Bugatti EB110, which finally caught up to that 550 horsepower level. So for power alone, purely that on-paper spec, this car is remarkable. A 6.1 litre, 550 horsepower V12. But then, when you combine that with the fact that it had a six-speed manual gearbox, rear-wheel drive, and a stripped-out interior that didn't even have rear seats, but was still production-ready, in other words, it wasn't too over the top, it wasn't a pure, non-road legal, no soundproof track day special, it was a road legal car. Well, this would have been insane. And although BMW, as I said, didn't even announce or allow anyone to know that it was real, the performance was incredible. In fact, although we don't know for sure exactly how quick it is, you can surmise it does 200. <laughs> Chances are it does more. And although BMW, to my knowledge at least, never officially announced the car's weight, well, based on the fact that the standard 850 weighs under 1800 kilos, with this car in its stripped out form, but of course with a large engine, you could safely assume it probably weighs at least 100 to 150 kilos less, maybe even close to 200. So in other words, it would have been the ultimate supercar, and probably the fastest car in the world as well. Now, with everything that I've just said, what you should be thinking right now is, why the hell didn't they make this? <laughs> because if you're talking about a car with these kinds of minds behind it, a vehicle that isn't just a garden shed special, it's ready to go, built by brilliant people, it looks the part, it goes like hell, it would have been the ultimate marketing ploy, if nothing else, to sell normal 8 Series cars. So, what happened? Well, unfortunately, what happened is the bean count has happened, because they presented it to BMW, and those in charge of, you know, the financial decisions of business, the less sexy side of it, decided that the car wasn't viable. And as unglamorous as that is, as an end for an amazing car, I kind of get what they were going at, because on this occasion, as much as I hate to say it, I agree with them. And the reason why I agree, not from a personal or petrol head perspective, but purely on their argument of money, is that the numbers just don't lie. This car, to be financially viable, would have had to have been double the price of a top tier Porsche 911 at the time. And BMW simply didn't believe that people would pay twice Porsche money for this car. And they were probably right, unfortunately, because even though we think that sounds crazy today, in the four years that the actual top-tier 850 CSI was produced, four years, only 1,500 were sold. That's not exactly a great number. And with this car having significantly higher development costs, especially to mass-produce it, if that were going to be the case, well, unfortunately, I get what they were going for. It wouldn't have been a smart decision, considering that even the normal 8 Series didn't sell as well as they were hoping they would. Ultimately, the M8 is, you could say, one of the top-tier BMW unicorns. Up there was stuff like the X5 Le Mans that we talked about, of course, the V16 Goldfish, and a number of other crazy cars that they've had over the years. It really is amazing when you look behind the scenes of many of these large companies who you might not necessarily think of as creating crazy cars most of the time, but chances are they probably have. Even companies like Skoda or Volkswagen have had some wacky cars back in their history. And even though, of course, now we do technically have a BMW M8, which, despite the fact that it has more power than this car, still is a financially viable option, it actually goes to show how different the market is today to what it was in 1990, or at least what it most likely would have been to this car, especially when in 1992 the financial crises were taking hold a lot more. 
so understandably the car wasn't produced, but that doesn't make it any less sad. And of course, if you are new to Unsung Heroes, you should click the link down below to jump over to the Discord chat for this channel, because there's a voting poll on there with all of the cars in Unsung Heroes, and then for the big episode 100, which is very soon now, we're going to be counting down the community's top 10 favourite cars that I've talked about in the entire series. So if you want this one to be there, jump over there and vote for it. But overall, that's it for this instalment. Of course, I'll see you guys next time, and for now, as always, Thanks for watching.